you say give no options, then it will take the default, which is to update and upgrade whatever the current package state is. So you can see it generated a, a signature file with details about update and upgrade. Now you can, let's assume you take the signature file, update your URIs on a USB stick, and switch to a Windows box. And on the Windows box, you are supposed to run the get operation, which is uh, for get, you can just simply run get and give it the file. And maybe you can increase the number of connections so that we can quickly complete the demo. And you can also create a simple archive file for simplicity update.zip. So when you do this, uh, any platform which supports Python, it will be able to download all the APT database, I mean, package database, and other things. So this turns out to be a Jesse box, I mean, Jesse release, so it's pulling in Jesse. <clears throat> Um, this operation was not supposed to be run as root. It can be run as a uh, normal user, but the set and the install operation, APT requires them to be run as root. So as you see, uh, it created a zip archive, which has all the details about package management, and the user does not have to worry. He can just copy it onto a, a transfer to a USB stick and take it back home to the Debian machine. So we're back to the Debian machine, and you can just say, in this case, you need root over here. Apt offline, install, and give it the, what is the name? Update.zip. And <clears throat> so it did everything. It has updated your APT database. It ensures that all the packages that have been downloaded have not been tampered. For that, it ensures that it verifies the signature of every package database file. I'll just extend this example a little bit more and create a new set of, okay, set in a, an example of, a, suppose you want to install a new package, and you can give an option, install packages, and um, let's say Emacs, which may have some more dependencies, and it will create the database for Emacs and all its dependencies. You can go back to the Windows box, and say the same thing, perhaps with emacs.zip, and um, what was the name? Install it, you guys. And you can also download bug reports on the offline machine, I mean, for, for reference on the offline machine, if you are interested in knowing what were the reported bugs at that point in time, so you can just say, but, uh, bug reports, but this is only supported for the Debian BTS. And if you do this, it will download all the packages and their dependencies, and in the background also is downloading the bug reports for those packages. The progress bar is not very complete. I had to write a progress bar which could work on the Windows command interpreter and it's a little painful. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is something which is fixed, but uh, in the version that I'm running here, it's not fixed. It, this is happening mostly due to uh, multi-arc packages. For the same package name, you have uh, multiple uh, architectures, so in that case, the bug reports are common. I think I'll just complete this one. How? Okay. Meanwhile, yes.
Okay. Um, I'll just, since it's still downloading the bug reports, which is slow, uh, Apt Offline also has a graphical user interface for people who may be more interested in uh, a UI. It's written in PyQt again, so it works on Linux, Windows, and Mac. Okay, we have one question, I guess. Um, uh, my question is about whether or not uh, the signatures, and the, I know that Apt has some timing constraints for when Apt signatures are considered legitimate. And if you're offline, maybe your clocks are not synced. If you ran into any issues around unsynced clocks and the imports of the keys, like have you tested this with a clock that's set in the future, for example, um, on, the, on the machine that's doing the stuff as root, or tested it with a clock set far in the past? to see how it behaves? I never thought about that all. I, I Maybe I should go test it, but I, the, the, the only testing I did was in ensuring that the integrity of the downloads are legit, not tampered with. Okay, so one of the apt attacks is a pinning attack where you only show people uh, the archive from a date before a critical fix entered so that the person can't effectively upgrade. And the signatures all check out in that case. It's just old. So it's worth testing it against uh, against a different different synced clocks. Okay. Very cool, by the way. Thank you for working on it. Yeah, I have a minute. Yeah. So actually, my download is complete. So I can just wrap it up saying that if you run apt offline install emacs.zip, since there were bug reports for emacs, you have all the bug reports listed, and you can like take an example of seven nine one eight one eight. And if you do, you get the entire bug reports as it is, and you can decide whether you'd like to upgrade or not. That's pretty much about up to offline. Okay. Thank you very much. Just as a reminder, if you have a question, please wait for a microphone to appear in your hands, and then ask the question. So whilst we whilst we faff about a bit, um, I think please welcome Lior, who is going to talk to you about um, right. Sorry, I can do it this way. Right to left support in LibreOffice, and he'll be ready in a moment. The clock is ticking. bit about right to left issues in LibreOffice. I guess that this is, except for maybe the resolution, uh, should be very familiar, regular uh, LibreOffice. Who here uses LibreOffice? Okay, should be fairly reasonable. Um, so we're going to go over how it looks like in right to left mode and then add a little bit of translation. First, will show how it looks in right to left mode. As you can notice, all the menus are on the right side, and the direction of the items is also shifted. So the new uh, button is actually here on the right side, and the menu open like this. OK, yes, I know it looks really weird. And that's with the uh, English translation. I told you a little bit at the beginning. Um, at that point, we still don't have any directionality. Um, there is a, a difference in when writing text between the alignment of the text, like let's have text to align to the left, to the center, to the right, but there's a difference between uh, where the dot is, and this is directionality. Currently, we're still in uh, left to right directionality, so this is why the dot is at the far end. Um, in this interface, because we only change uh, the interface itself, we don't have directionality option. So what I'm going to do is just install the Hebrew support, which also automatically turns on the directionality features. And we don't need this. 
anymore. But first of all, although we have uh, the Hebrew support, it's still uh, English interface. I'll, you'll excuse me for doing this behind the scenes, but we can, it can be done from the interface itself. Okay, so it looks quite the same, but it has Hebrew translations. But, well, wait. Okay, we enabled complex text la layout, which is CTL. <laughs> this is the stuff right here. And it says Hebrew. And whenever you tick this one, you have a few more buttons in LibreOffice. And let's see where it is. It's in the interface, probably somewhere here. And yes, this is directionality. Okay. Uh, I switch back to English interface so you could read it this as well. So it wouldn't be just me who can uh, read stuff. <coughs> and we're. So these are the two buttons which are add, which are added um, and control the directionality. So if we had <coughs> text and a dot, now the dot goes to the other side. And this is regardless of alignment. Okay, these are totally two different things. Um, which directionality and alignment cause hell for other languages, although Usually native speakers to English or any Latin language are not familiar with the directionality. It causes many troubles. Um, LibreOffice has, has a few more bugs regarding uh, supporting different directionalities. And for example, I'm only going to press the right uh, error button. So I'm going from one cell to another, to the another, and then going right, you just flip cells. So it's a weird bug, and I can't actually reach the middle of that cell. Okay, this is just because of directionality issues. Um, these kind of bugs appear in a lot of places in LibreOffice, or for that matter, any software that tries to support uh, right to left. Thank you. Um, and we here have a, even more complex bugs. We're trying to mix an English word in the middle of a Hebrew sentence, uh, trying to control where the uh, punctuation mark goes, especially at the end. What happens when a sentence starts with an English word? Then, let's say GTK thinks it's the whole sentence is in English, but the rest is in Hebrew. So there's you need, sometimes needs to force the directionality. Um, one option, let me get a new one. Can you make the font big? Yeah. Okay. So one of the things, oh, of course, for those who see the comments are on the other side, obviously. Okay, compare it to English. Um, we can insert <coughs> also can insert special marks and well I'm not sure liberal supports L uh, RLM and LRM which force the directionality um, which sometimes we need to add to different um, sentences in order to force it to be seen correctly. Uh, for example, sometimes in the Debian in story translations or other translations done, well, by me, so it's mostly Debian, uh, we put these kind of marks to force um, the display settings. Any questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, wait, question. Wait, wait, wait for the mic. Mm -hmm. Test. Thank you. Does it? Does it work? Ooh. 
Up, test. This other one? Test, test, test. Okay, thank you. Okay, so ask me and I'll repeat the question. No, 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 it's just a question. It goes to the video. It's, it's the same problems for Arabic, um, Farsi, uh, Urdu, which is in Pakistan. Um, although Hebrew is spoken by very few people in, you know, in relatively to other languages, um, computer-wise we're doing quite a lot of noise. And especially in other products um, regard with open source or without open source, uh, usually support for Hebrew considers quite well. Um, I'm trying to uh, influence the LibreOffice developers to fix all the bugs, so I try to do a yearly or bi-yearly uh, status report. And next month I'm going to their uh, conference to talk with them personally. So each year trying to fix a few more bugs. Any more questions? Thank you. Hello? Is this it's okay? Test, test. Test, 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 test. Test, test. It's not loud enough. Not loud enough? Test, test. <coughs> test, test. Okay? okay. Test, 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 test. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Shall I just start? Yeah. Okay, so, hello. I'm going to tell to speak about how we test tails in well, the Tails is an operating, sy an operating system, it's a live system, and we have uh, in the last few years developed some kind of testing framework that could be possibly reused by other projects. So I'm going to introduce how to do it and show it a bit. So the way we do it is that we mostly do integration testing. That is, we, what we care about is mostly testing the exact product we're going to ship to users, not isolated parts. We want to see if the entire thing works together properly. So we are not doing much unit testing. We are doing some, but that's not what this talk is about. So that's no big news. I mean, lots of operating systems have integration tests. What is maybe a little bit uh, specific to the way we are doing it is that we are focusing on black box testing. That is, we are testing the system from the outside. We are trying to, we try to interact with the system under test, that is a running tails, in as much as we can, the same way as uh, most users would do it. Which means we don't trust the system under test. We are not asking the system under test, hey, did you manage to do that? We are clicking buttons, stuff like that, and checking if the expected result appears or is spoken or something. In contrast, many other integration integrate integration testing of operating system I've seen use the use accessibility interfaces discovered over dbus which is fine because you actually test that you have accessibility support but it's also cheating quite a bit you're always actually asking the system or test if it's behaving properly which is not the way we prefer to do it 
So I'm going to start with showing some uh, short excerpts of the, the today's automated test suite running. It's a video and then I run some more live. So as you can see, we're in a GNOME interface and here what we are trying to see, it's verifying that events can open PDF files and print files in the home directory. As you see, it succeeds, we're happy, we go on. And then we are going to test if we can open a PDF file from home, it still works. Why are we testing that? It's mostly because we are shipping a par more profiles that restrict what events can do. So we are tr first tra testing if it works in the places where it should, it's supposed to be, a to be able to read and write from and to. And then <coughs> we are going to test Maybe not actually, yes. We're going to test whether we can open a PDF file that's in home GNU PG. And the, the result is that uh, we won't see it. Anyway, we have a forbidden message and we actually see also checking in the kernel logs if Apparmore has logged the denier. We can do a lot more. We can uh, also pretend to install Tails on a USB device. In this case, we are using Libvirt and it can emulate uh, virtual USB devices. So the next test case we'll see is to clone and install Tails on a USB stick and then rebooting, seti setting up a persistent volume and then doing basically the same events test. So for this framework is based on three main tools. One is libvirt. Libvirt, we use it to manage VMs, start shut down them, to manage snapshots in order to make the whole thing a bit faster. We use it to manage networks, storage, including uh, virtual USB sticks, and uh, quite a few other things like memory snapshots and shared folders. So the second tool we are using intensively is Sikuli. Sikuli, we use it to interact with the operating system. That is to find images on screen, like buttons and click on them, to emit input events like clicking and typing text. And we don't use its OCR feature because in our experience is very suboptimal. And all this is driven by Cucumber, which is a Ruby tool, tool that allows, you to, allows one to write tests in a kind of human readable way that can be used to discuss with design teams, UX people, users. For example, before developing a new feature, you can discuss with the other stakeholders how it should look like, how it should work. So I'm going to show you how some this test definition look like. So for example, this test checks that Tails does not leak the host name when uh, over the LAN when doing DHCP requests. So that's, um, we're not very good at writing these things in a very nice way, but at least it's more readable by non-technical people than many or most other ways of writing automated tests. So it's, you write it this way and then you have to implement each step, that is each line in another file somewhere else. That's a mo more or less the same, but a bit com more complicated because here we are setting up uh, a new network manager connection to make sure that our tweaks apply not only to the default connection, but also to manually configured one. Let me go on showing you some bits of this. So the next test case is about <coughs> We also we have some tail specific bits in the test suite, like we are actually sniffing the network, uh, the VM runs in constantly, and after the fact we are checking that no connection was sent to the internet without going for Tor. And we have tests that should fail, and we check they fail. Like here we are using the NSAF browser, that is this uh, special br web browser in tail that is allowed to, to go out without Tor, and so we check that our test suite frameworks actually um, notices that there's traffic going out without Tor, which gives us more confidence when we are testing that we cannot find any otherwise. Okay, 
Yeah. So the uh, yeah. So that's it. Equally, cucumber omelet vert. And so we have a few taste specific bits and more ideas about how it could be used elsewhere. That's the main purpose of this talk. So a few months ago, we st uh, Holger tried to extract the framework from the Tails Git tree and reuse it for the DI installation, DI tests. And it's the effort stopped mainly thanks to the reflectible build vertex. But uh, it's not impossible at all, and it anyone should could do it. So we could use that to test, for example, that you can dis upgrade from JC to stretch graphically from a desktop. We could use that to ensure some sanity checks, like we have no services listening in the network except SCGD, stuff like that. We could use it for AppArmor. We do that in Tails a lot. It could be done in Debian. <coughs> it's also a good, a nice way to. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, it's also a nice way to to describe what what we are supposed to support. That is to describe a minimal feature set and negotiate it with other stakeholders, users, design people and all, and then make sure we have no regression in the new Debian release. And ideally, I'd like to see it used in integrated into auto package tests. Mm, I have no idea how it's doable or not. And I also think we also have sound tests, such as we can check that we an application is playing audio, which could be test used to check that our car, for example, properly reads text it's supposed to read. That's it. Not so. so ah, we hear me, it's good, but we don't hear the it's computer. For the, demo. No. for the computer. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Oui, mais je sais plus comment je si je veux remplacer no, c'est quoi déjà si je sens plus. Oh, no. So it, 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 it works but uh, well. Well, let's go. Okay, thanks. So hello everybody. So I would like to uh, introduce uh, to you today Mm, the work uh, which is uh, done by the HIPRA developers, uh, HIPRA, which is a, a company wo which tries making a fully universal Debian uh, to make it universally usable. Uh, indeed, uh, as uh, we know, Debian is the uh, universal operating system because it can be run on various platforms. Mm, but I would like uh, in my dreams that also Debian could be used by uh, really all the people who try to use free software uh, and uh, computers. And especially, I would love that uh, the sites and uh, the, problem, uh, the problem which can be present when uh, you are blind or we have problems of the, the sites mm, are not present. And for that, uh, here's somewhat what we pro pro propose, what we provide, and the developments we started doing, and uh, how it can uh, be uh, shipped in Debian. The first thing is, well, it's a French system, of course, because uh, <laughs> it's originally a French system. But you recognize, everyone can recognize that it's a made desktop. 
We chose MATE because the GNOME 3 experience was absolutely terrible for us. Uh, for various reasons, uh, firstly because when uh, GNOME 3 was released uh, some years ago, it wasn't at all, it wasn't accessible at all. It was so less accessible that some Debian developers, which is blind, with blind, left Debian. And also because GNOME 3 today, which is more accessible indeed, mm, is yet very difficult to understand for a blind people. Difficult because there are some panels, but we don't know where are panels, where are icons, icons, and how things are organized. So for any people, for beginner people, it's very difficult to train that and to learn that. That's why we choose mates, uh, but the first reason. On mate, we can move on the desktop, moving the keys and the arrow keys. Mm. We added on Mate a layer which enables the speech synthesizer, as you can hear. This speech synthesizer, which is based on the Orca screen reader, and uh, a, a speech synthesizer, which is not free, unfortunately, uh, enables the people to have the full control of the computer without the help of his eyes. So it is very important for him. For him. For example, he can go in the panel to choose the program he wants to run. We choose also LibreOffice 4.2. Why this release and why it's different from the official uh, LibreOffice in Debian? Because in 4.2 there are not some accessibility bugs which exist in the official LibreOffice in Debian. So we chose this release to be sure that the user can have a good experience. And I talk about the beginner user, the basic user. In Writer, through the screen reader, we can have access to all the parts of the screen by the keyboard and by the screen reader. And on Mate, I need to precise also, also that we have such access to the panel, the top panel. How many? Five, Five minutes, okay. The, so of, of the top panel and uh, of the, the, the bottom panel. Then on uh, this layer, we added a Compiz layer. Why Compiz? Because Compiz enables visual effects which can be very interesting. For example, we can easily, with Compiz, uh, apply a zoom with this combination. And, uh, oops, it works. I don't, I'm not sure it works. And we can also do a color, uh, a, uh, so some color tweaks. For example, to revert the colors. Or revert the colors. Oops. Oops. It, it, it's, not it's not the easiest for me to. <laughs> <laughs> to add such technologies, of course. Hopla. Hopla. So it can do a color reversion. So thanks to that, we have a PC that can be used by blind people, by people who have sight problems, and uh, that people who are blind or people who have a difficult vision. And to finish, I would say that uh, we access by the, that to Ice Whistle, to Ice Dove, and all the accessible Debian applications. And to finish, I would say that if we choose Mate also, it's because it enables to uh, not follow the themes logics. For example, if you are not happy with the coloration of some bar of the coloration of some object, you can change it in the Mate preferences menu. Alt -Bosch. Bureau -Cad -Cad. Here, you can choose. Here, you can choose the appearance of each theme on uh, each object of your theme. And it's much interesting, very interesting, because in the GNOME 3 or the typical desktop today, you cannot do that. And so if you only need to change the colors of the mouse or the colors of such items, you cannot do it. 
we've made, or you can do that because the customization is fully possible. And so it enables a universal access to the computer and it enables Debian to be quickly uh, universal. So that's, we hope to uh, upload in the next uh, Debian, uh, at least in part. For example, we are searching for a mentor to upload compies uh, so that we have this effect and we can set Debian to have this. And uh, it enables to, 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 um, to have that in Debian uh, to provide uh, a fully accessible system also for the beginner users. Ah, yeah, no, je, I go. <laughs> I'm waiting. <laughs> No, but uh, Mario, it's very interesting because uh, is, uh, I didn't know you were here. <laughs> and I'm very interested in that. <laughs> no, but to, to be honest with you, I was very careful because I didn't want to, to speak for him because, well, I'm not him. But if he's here, I would be very interesting to know what you, you thought about GNOME 3 and why you, you, you well, you stopped maintaining GNOME 3 uh, two years ago. And maybe you, you could explain why you preferred to choose Mac instead of uh, Linux today, and uh, there is a right reason, and I think it's very interesting if you could explain it, I think. Uh, it's like actually a long story, but, but the short story is that uh, specifically this GNOME 3, the early GNOME 3 days was really not efficient. It was compared to like the, the GNOME 230 release, which were almost perfect, I'd say. There were many things that actually worked, and then, you know, you got like go to 3.0, That's exactly what motivated us to try to back to GNOME 2, to find back the accessibility, the full accessibility, and the reasons for which today also GNOME 3 isn't very used because it's very a problem for us today to be used uh, in the daily life for the, the, the people in, in the computing in general. Yeah, the lack of Okay, so set a timer for two and a half minutes. Okay. Is there an HDMI? Yes. Ah, perfect. Okay, yeah, Natty, set up. Wow. Set a timer for two and a half minutes, and we'll see what I can do. Great. Yay. Super. Uh, So I'm going to show you storm.debian.net, which is a sort of Google Docs alternative that anyone involved in Debian can use for Debian stuff. Um, so I'm going to zoom out. OK. Great. So uh, this is what the main dashboard looks like. And I'm going to make a text document and share it with people in IRC. 
and then I'm going to sit down, and you're all going to keep chatting without me. So uh, in Sandstorm, which is the software that powers this, you can click Install Apps. We'll install Etherpad. Uh, I'll click New Etherpad Document. I'll click Share, and I'll make a link that I can publish on IRC. Great. Great. Uh, so now everyone in IRC, please deface my pad. Um, so I'm hopeful that Debian people can consider using this as a possible alternative to TitanPad, because one cool thing about Sandstorm is you can upload your own packages. You're not limited to whatever TitanPad does. Uh, and the other advantage over TitanPad is that you have this sort of home view where you can see the documents you've made. Uh, so I'll go back into this one. Come on, hopefully someone's just, yes, great. Uh, and in order to use the service, so any of you can use it, uh, you'll have to email me to get an invite, which I'll send to you. Um, <laughs> great. Uh, and Clint said he would co-maintain this with me. I don't know if Clint's in the audience. Okay, but uh, yeah, you can all use this. Uh, the front page of storm.debian.net says how. Thanks. Whoa. <laughs> um, can you reassign it? Oh, sorry. So this is a rather short presentation, only seven slides. So uh, it was originally planned like a, for a lightning talk, but I managed to uh, hand my proposal that late, so yeah. <laughs> Yay, so now just full size it somehow, I full screen it, and then it should work. Okay, so I'm pr uh, presenting today Duck, the Debian URL checker. Um, the reason behind this is uh, function, yes, thank you. Yeah, the reason why I did this is exactly this. You see a debt checkout, bugs everywhere, and then it yeah, says basically a debt checkout does not work. It was look, and I was like, this was in a time I was trying to get my, uh, to increase my involvement into Debian, and it was like, okay, this sh should be fixed somehow. And then, uh, yeah, there are many, like in the, in the control file, there are several URLs defined. The, for example, you have the VCS Git URL or the VCS browser URL, which in this case uh, shows me the repository file. Probably you already have seen the screen. Yeah, the whole thing is um, I check those uh, links and entries in the control file on a daily basis. Currently, we have about 2,000, yeah, 2,300 something uh, uh, packages which have broken URLs. These are either home pages or upstream, yeah, upstream home pages, or problems with the emails of the maintainers, or uh, yeah, any other problems with URLs. And um, there's also a package available which you can run locally, and this also shows all those informations for you. And uh, I made a challenge. So if you like fix uh, one of your packages until the end of DebConf 11, you get one of those awesome lighters. I know this is kind of like uh, short time, so I have a bag full of them here. And if you really promise me hard to fix your stuff, then you can take one out. Thank you. Thank you.